Well, good morning. My name is Stephen Shetterly. I am the Director of Local and Global Outreach here at BCC and happy to be able to share this message with you this morning. So our sermon today is going to be from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 28. And if you'd like to follow along with me as I read, let's do that. So Genesis 32, verses 22 through 28. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I want to start today by sharing with you one of my favorite things to have happened in in the internet over the last, I don't know, five or six years here. It took place in Great Britain, which is a land of both stuffiness and silliness. And so way back in 2016, the British government was preparing to commission a new polar research vessel. And if you've ever owned a boat, you probably know that picking a proper name for your craft is kind of a big deal for some people. Well, even more so in Great Britain, which for generations was the world's premier naval power. And so it's a little hard to explain why someone with the power to make such decisions opted to choose the name for the Queen's new royal research vessel via an online poll. I mean, whoever green-lighted this decision had clearly never used the internet before. An online poll, open to the public, really? Like, this is not going to end well. Nevertheless, the naming contest went forward, it was publicized, they dutifully compiled the results of hundreds of thousands of votes, And in the end, a clear winner emerged with the top choice gaining nearly four times as many votes as the next runner-up. Over 120,000 internet citizens thought that the best name for this new state-of-the-art royal research ship would be Bodie McBoatface. I repeat, that is Bodie McBoatface. I mean, you have to love the internet. In the end, though, the stuffy side of British culture won out over its silly side, and the ship was named the Sir David Attenborough, which is a name that cannot be said without slipping into a British accent and sort of angling your nose slightly up in the air. I mean, what's in a name anyway? Why not name this expensive new research ship the Bodie McBoatface? Names, I think, at their best should reflect something of the character, the essence of whoever or whatever they refer to. The Bible is sort of obsessed with stories about names, explanations of why a certain place is named what it is, stories of angels telling expectant parents what to name their children, stories of people's names being changed in the middle of their lives. We are in a series uh, called Questions God Asks Us. So last week we heard from Pastor Phil about that first question in the Bible that God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? This week we'll be staying in Genesis and we'll be looking at a question from the narrative of Jacob's life. God's question for us this week is a deceptively simple one. What is your name? In Jacob's case, we'll see that it's actually a life-changing question. And the question is, could it be a life-changing question for us too? Well, it's really hard to tell any of Jacob's story without sort of telling the whole thing because it all hangs together. We're looking at the most important moment in his life today. And we need to know what came before that. It starts with Abraham's son Isaac and his wife Rebecca, who chose some strange names for their twin sons, sons that they had been promised would each in time become their own powerful nation. We know their names as Esau and Jacob. And the meaning of those names in Hebrew? Esau means red, and Jacob means essentially heel grabber. That's right. When they were born, Esau came out all red and feisty and ready to take on the world. His twin brother Jacob came right along behind him, holding on to Esau's heel as if to say, get back here and let me show you a thing or two, brother. Well, things between Jacob and Esau sort of went downhill from there. 
Unfortunately for Jacob, the heel grabber, his strange, very literal name is also a Hebrew idiom, which translates into English as something like deceiver or trickster or usurper. It's a meaning that's going to follow Jacob around like a shadow, tainting his interactions with those that he's closest to in life. So Jacob spends his early life tricking his brother out of his birthright and then plotting with his mom to steal the blessing that his elderly father wants to give to Esau. I mean, talk about dysfunctional family dynamics. And so after that little episode, Jacob runs. Esau has had enough of his deceitful brother. He vows to kill him, and so Jacob leaves town post-haste. Now, for a while in Genesis 29, we think that maybe Jacob has met his match as he comes in contact with his slick-talking uncle Laban, who manages to get Jacob to take both of his daughters as wives when Jacob was not really interested in a package deal. After two decades, though, Jacob devises a way to cheat the cheater and steal the best of his livestock, along with Laban's daughters and grandkids. And true to form, he waits until the opportune moment, and then he picks up and runs. Except now it seems like the walls are beginning to close in a little bit on Jacob. He is running out of places to run. In getting away from Laban, he's heading back home to his family that he left behind and, most alarmingly, back to his brother, Esau. And you can imagine that Esau has probably been in the back of Jacob's mind all those years that he's been away. If someone had sworn to kill you, they'd probably stick in your mind too. And Jacob is terrified. So he does some quick thinking ever the manipulator, he decides to try and buy off his brother by giving him large amounts of livestock and other gifts. He's hoping and he's praying that these gifts are going to soften Esau's heart toward him or at least show Esau that Jacob could be more useful alive than dead. And it had better work because Jacob hears that Esau is now coming to meet him with a force of 400 men. As a further precaution, with Esau coming near, Jacob splits up his household and his flocks and he sends them to the other side of the Jabbok. He wants to put another barrier between Esau and all that Jacob holds dear. And then as night falls, Jacob comes back across the river by himself to face his brother alone. I imagine that he's exhausted at this point, that he's frazzled, scared. In a sense, he's sort of naked and exposed. He has left everything that he values and cares about on the other side of the river. And now all he can do is wait for the decisive moment when he meets his nemesis face to face. And then suddenly things get weird, very weird. This is one of those places in the Bible where the more carefully you read, the more confused you get. You start asking, like, what on earth is actually going on here? Who is doing what? And I think it's very much on purpose. The narrator is letting you feel this disorientation and confusion and terror that Jacob himself feels. Because waiting for Jacob on the banks of the Jabbok is a stranger in the night. So a number of years back, I went out camping by myself on the east side of the mountains. I drove my little hatchback Honda across the North Cascades Highway. I found a free campsite in a totally empty campground in the foothills outside of Mazama. And as darkness fell, I made a fire. I hung out doing whatever it is that I did back in the days before kids. I don't really remember what that was. But when an old pickup truck rolled into, camp, into the campground an hour or two after dark, I just assumed it was someone coming in late and was going to set up camp. Well, instead, it pulled right over to where my tent was set up, and a guy got out with his big old dog and asked to share my fire. Sure, go right ahead, shady fellow. Happy to have the company. Also, please don't murder me here in this dark, empty campground. I mean, I've had some exciting times during many years of camping and hiking, but that was one of the more tense moments in all my adventures. I felt like a true crime story was being written right in front of my eyes and that I was playing the role of hapless victim number one. Well, nothing came of it in the end. We talked for 20 minutes or so, and the guy headed on down the road. But let's just say that hanging out with a stranger and his dog in a dark abandoned campground miles from civilization is nowhere on my list of life experiences that I want to repeat. Well, how much more terrifying for Jacob then that the first thing that this stranger does when he sees Jacob is to attack him. Jacob and the stranger, they wrestle for the entire night. Jacob is fighting for his life in the dark and he's probably super confused. They wrestle for hours to an absolute standstill and then a touch. The stranger touches Jacob's hip and pain shoots through his body. His hip is wrenched and still he doesn't let the man go. And at this point, if not before, it must have dawned on Jacob that this was no ordinary man that he's wrestling with. A single touch, and Jacob is almost incapacitated. And then this. 
let me go, the not-so-ordinary man says. And, and to me, this sounds almost like a test. Are you going to let me go? Are you going to try and sneak away like you always do, Jacob? Is this where we part ways? And Jacob either courageously or foolishly refuses to let the man go. Bless me, Jacob says. I won't let you go unless you bless me. Which is an interesting request to make of a dude that you have just been wrestling with all night. Bless me? Really? But in a way, it makes sense. It seems like this is a refrain that you can hear echoing down through Jacob's entire life. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Do you know anyone like this? Anyone who longs for blessing and attention, for recognition and love? And no matter how many times they get it, that blessing, that it's never quite enough. Actually, I think Jacob speaks for all of us here. I think that that longing to be blessed is a symptom that we all experience in a fallen world. And that craving for blessing is behind a lot of the terrible things that we do to one another because we assume that for me to receive a blessing means that I need to take it from my brother over there. Well, here's the deal with Jacob, though. Of the twins that were born to Isaac and Rebekah, it was Jacob who was prophesied to become the more powerful of the two and to rule over his older brother. So the blessing was there from the start. But this prophecy wasn't enough for him. Jacob, it seems, had always felt like the underdog, the forgotten one. His whole life, he's the one who thought that he had to cheat and trick and manipulate his way into getting that blessing. He steals his father's blessing. He begs his uncle's blessing to marry his daughter. Now he's hoping and praying that his brother will bless rather than curse him when they finally meet. Bless me, bless me, just bless me. But blessings, real blessings, can't actually be stolen or coerced or demanded, can they? They can only be bestowed or granted or gifted. But here Jacob is. He's feeling as though he's wrestled this God-man into submission and he's going to wring a blessing out of him. Bless me, he demands. And the stranger answers very curiously here. He answers with a question that doesn't appear to have anything to do with the blessing. What is your name? I think that here we see who actually has the power in this situation. Jacob thinks that he's wrestled this stranger into submission, that he can demand and receive a blessing. But by asking Jacob's name, it's like the stranger suddenly brushes aside everything and he reaches straight into Jacob's heart. When we see power encounters like this in Scripture, it seems that to know someone's name is to have authority over them. When I call something by its true name, I can command it to do what I want. Well, that's a big reason why God in the Old Testament doesn't ever really give anyone his name. The closest that you get is God telling Moses, I am who I am. You don't get to know my name because you don't get to have control over me. Well, the stranger doesn't need to ask Jacob's name. He knows everything there is to know about this little swindler. By now, it's starting to dawn on us that this man that Jacob is wrestling against is probably none other than Yahweh himself. God doesn't need to know Jacob's name, but Jacob needs to speak it. He needs to experience revealing himself, his true self, to someone else. One commentator says that just by speaking his name here, Jacob is uttering his confession before God. What is your name? The stranger asks. Jacob, he answers. Heel grabber, deceiver, cheat, liar. That's who I am. That's who I've been since before I was born. That's how I get on in this world. I am Jacob, the untrustworthy, Jacob, the phony, Jacob, the selfish. Let's stop there for a minute and think about this. How do you answer that question? What's your name? When you think about who you are, what words come to mind? For many of us, I think this can be painful territory to wander into. Jacob literally had a name that reflected the course of his life. He kind of carried his identity on his sleeve in that way. But most of us carry those parts of who we are a little closer to home. So what is your name? How has the world tried to define you? How have you defined yourself? Jacob was a cheat and a deceiver. What names define you? I'm willing to bet that for many of us, deep down, we carry around names that are at least as harsh as Jacob's. So what names have you been called? Useless? Disappointment? Not quite good enough? What about failure? Addict? Dumb? Poor? unattractive, unlovable, unreliable, untrustworthy, dirty, tainted, spoiled, clueless, worthless, helpless. 
We're handed these labels throughout life, and some of them stick around for a long, long time. Some of them sink so deep into us that we just assume that they have been there from the beginning. Like Jacob, wrestling with the stranger. What's your name? Who are you? I'm a deceiver, Lord, a fake and a fraud. And the reply? Not anymore. Not anymore. Because here by the river, alone and afraid, Jacob has encountered the one who gives new names. He has wrestled in the dark with the only one whose blessing ultimately matters. He's clung tight to him and refused to let him go despite the pain and the wound that he's received from him. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. What's in a name? A whole lot, apparently. Jacob has begged for a blessing, and he's been given not just a new name, but a new identity. That's more than a blessing. That's an act of creation, and it's something that only a creator can do. The swindler and cheat and con man has been given a new life, a new calling. And as the sun rose that morning, it wasn't Jacob who limped away into the rest of his life. It was Israel. So centuries later, one of Israel's descendants would face his own nighttime wrestling match alone in the dark with God. And by way of closing, I think it's worth putting these two wrestling matches up next to each other to see how they illuminate each other. Unlike Jacob, this descendant of his wasn't a wealthy man. He didn't have flocks or herds or wives or offspring to worry about. He did, however, have 12 followers, not that different from the 12 tribes of Israel that Jacob fathered. And this wrestling match didn't take place by a river, but in a garden. The man was so worn down by his struggle that he said at one point, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He sweated from his exertion, and it was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Unlike his trickster ancestor, though, this descendant of Jacob's had never had a need to confess his name before God or to have it changed through an act of divine grace. No, his name had been announced by angels. His name was a good name, the name above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Yeshua, Jesus, which means God is salvation. Jesus struggled with God in the Garden of Gethsemane, not for his own sake, but for ours. His wrestling match led to our salvation, and the wound that he received wasn't a wrenched hip, but death, with a capital D. Death itself would be poured out on him. Death itself would be conquered by him, because Jesus, unlike Jacob, wasn't seeking a blessing for his own sake, but for ours. Because Jesus wrestled and ultimately submitted himself to his Father's will on the cross, You and I are the ones who are blessed. On Jesus' behalf, we are given new names, new identities, new life. So whatever names and labels you've been carrying around with you, no matter how deep they've sunk or how much you figure that they are just a part of you, just know that today God asks you that simple, profound question that he asked Jacob. What is your name? He alone can take it and exchange it for something new, something good. Rejoice that we have a God who is in the business of handing out new names. The wrestling and suffering of Jesus, who is the true and better Jacob, that is our focus now as we turn to the table of the Lord's Supper. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, so many times in Scripture, you introduce yourself as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And boy, what a loser that Jacob was. What a basket case of a human being. And, but how very like us he is. Fearful, deceptive, scheming, selfish. And yet, and yet you claim him. He's part of the family. The family that you ransomed for your own. The family that you will use ultimately to rescue the world. Help us to know this morning that we too are part of the family, that we are embraced by you, not reluctantly, not with a roll of the eyes, not with a shake of the head, but fully and completely embraced and given our new names. Help us, like Jacob, who turned into Israel, to accept and to live into our new identities. Help us to live freely in the new life that you offer us. Would you guide and guard us now and always, we pray. Amen.